It is now evening, Mardrift. Tonight is our test with the brave 10 volunteers, of which all 10 citizens did volunteer, and Extinction Keeper Laos and myself, George Tolfia, did not need to pick anyone. So I thank all of our volunteers for that. I am only mentioning this test again because I want to remind those of you who are not part of it that you should not be peering out your windows or opening your doors to speak or wave or make any kind of gesture to anyone you see wandering outside. Doing that would put you, the volunteers, the Queen's Guard and all of Mardrift really in unnecessary danger. It is after light set and everyone not involved with the test should be locked away safely in their homes. As always, I extend my gratitude to the Queen's Guard, those intending to stay and those who are soon to leave us and be replaced, as well as to the Enchanters who helped revise the paths for tonight's test and made this arcane light and sound system possible to begin with, and of course, all of Mardrift is forever grateful to our beloved Empress for sending the Queen's Guard and Enchanters to us. We have received a request directly from Whisperwood Portal in Queenstown. For those of you who do not know, Whisperwood Portal is the most prestigious institute of higher learning within Dezivia. Citadel Acclamations is actually one of their largest contributors and it's likely thanks to Extinction Keeper Lau's request for a tome from them for us here in Mardrift that they even know we exist. But I am getting ahead of myself. Whisperwood Portal has sent a request for extraordinarily truthful statements alongside routine and less interesting writings so long as they cover a consecutive month of life within Mardrift under the gaze of the feasting death and consist of more than a few sentences per entry. They are looking to research life here in Mardrift without risking themselves by coming to visit, which is perfectly understandable. Someone who submits their writings will be compensated at some point in the future after, but those who submit something that the Institute deems particularly useful for their research will receive a delayed extra monetary compensation after the Institute has finished reading through it. Now, I want to be very clear about this, Mardrift. Whisperwood Portal will pay for your writings about daily life here in Mardrift, but they are first and foremost a learning institute located within Queenstown. That is to say that they are within earshot of our beloved Empress's castle. You need to be mindful, more than mindful, you need to be purposefully diligent about everything you consider writing. The Queen's Guard haven't found anything in their inspections of your homes yet, and those are nearly complete, but they've confiscated a handful of writings and drawings that Extinction Keeper Laos has been forced to dispose of. If you send something of that nature, to Whisperwood Portal, the consequences will not be limited to your writings being thrown away and your compensation revoked. To be quite blunt, though I really shouldn't need to be, it is likely that the slightest hint of treason in your writing will result in you and your family's demises. So if you want to submit something to Whisperwood Portal, I highly encourage you to do so, but I request that you read your writing for another month or two before sending it off. There is plenty of time and no need to rush and make mistakes. Now I also need to address a few issues we may be having here at Mardrift. We are extremely self-sufficient due to our circumstances. The Feasting Death makes communication and actual travel nearly impossible outside of the town and the doves are not always quite high enough in the sky to remain out of its reach. This is nothing new to any of us. We are all well aware of the situation Mardrift is in and has been in for an exceptionally long time. However, we've not had this population that we do now any time in recent history. That is to say, with the enchanters who have permanently relocated here, 
and the Queen's Guard needing to be in such a number, it's come to my attention that some of our supplies may be running thin. A few of our accommodations that we don't necessarily need, but that which certainly make life here more tolerable, such as the mood enhancers that clay draft cells and the alcohol always available at the Sword Desert, those are the types of things we are beginning to see a decline in the stock of according to the reports that I've recently read over. Alcohol and the ingredients for sleeping draughts specifically are things that we are rapidly running out of, which unfortunately means that I have to sanction higher prices at the discretion of the sellers, and will in the future potentially, hopefully not, but potentially, need to raise the taxes on these items to afford maintaining Mardrif's usual supply. But in some slightly good news here, with many of the enchanters also being versed in a variety of, of... Well, really, I'm not sure how to put this. They know various amounts of magic. The herbs and draughts that we typically sell at high prices for health are in nearly full stock since our last inventory inspections, and so the prices on those can now be lowered. Just slightly, but lowered all the same. But what this actually means is that Mardrift is in good health physical health, at least. I understand the stress of our new system is still bothering some of you, but I think that we are all adjusting quite marvelously, and, well, really, I'm very proud of how things are going for us, Mondrift. We're having some setbacks, but overall, we're doing very well. And as a sort of reward for all of this, at least I view it as a reward, I have a, a unique story to read tonight. It is actually from Martina. This story was placed on Gonjin's desk sometime around Light Rise. Hopefully not before Light Rise, but certainly before she arrived at work today. I'm not sure of the validity of the piece, but the leather binding is quite old and clearly cracked by, well, either harsh light or a long time abandoned in the dry, dark wilds. It's a memoir, mentioning several places in Martina and written in a very nice hand that I've not seen anything else here in Mardrift written in before, although I can't say I've seen all of your handwriting, this is certainly not a handwriting I have come across. I don't know who submitted this, or if they wrote it, or it's a legitimate memoir, but all the same I found it to be interesting and somewhat humorous, so I thought I'd share it tonight to lift the town's spirits if I can. Since it is a memoir, there's no title. I can only assume the author is the name given to the person speaking throughout the writing, but I don't want to spoil anything though, so I will simply read it now. Luck has never been on my side. The day I was born, the Sunlands endured the only blizzard they have ever seen. When my goal was within my grasp, those I hired for help turned against me. And when I saw a permanent cure in eternal sleep, the gods cursed me with painless insomnia. My name is not synonymous with luck. My name is Adrian Volish. I was born under the screaming winds of a freak blizzard in the desert. A blizzard in the searing sunlands is uncommon enough. To hear such high-pitched winds in my home village of voiceless wastes, a place where a scream sounds like a whisper, made my coming into the land of Martina especially foreboding. Sometimes I muse that my parents would have been better leaving me for the beasts that roam the sands rather than accepting exile from the village. They travelled northwest to Data Bawa, an underground city in the desert that accepts any oddity, as I was without question an oddity. Wherever my parents carried me, clouds followed. Storms of rain and snow unlike anything the Sunlands was used to were common when I was around. I was also a fairly quiet babe, often letting out quiet hums and moans rather than crying for attention. Then there was the defining moment of my childhood where I screamed for the first time, because the first ray of sunlight I ever touched burned my flesh to the bone. I was a vampire born from human parents. But they loved me. I received an education about the world and myself in the dim caverns of Data Bauer. Magic piqued my interest the moment I learned the word. 
my life became devoted to it for many reasons. I was curious in nature, wanting to know more for the sake of knowing more, but also driven to find specific answers of how I came to be and if there was a way to change what I was. Being a vampire underground in the desert is not a horrific life to live, but my undead condition was unnatural even by typical standards, and the consequences of being what I was were sometimes too much to bear. I studied endlessly. Sleep was only taken at a minimum. Sustenance was to be purchased for me when necessary by helpful neighbours or travellers in need of coin. My parents provided a home and every necessity to keep me alive. All I had to do was study. And so I did. Until the age of 20, when I found a cure. This cure took the form of a curse. The long-forgotten and deceased first denizens of Martina's Maya Woods were druids of varied disposition. Most worshipped the moon, for there was a time in Martina's early history when that was the brightest light that shone upon the land. Through convoluted folk tales that hold more truth than any history written about that area, I discovered those druids had brought upon themselves a cursed object from their god. The object itself was questionable. Some texts said it was a book that had to be read under just the right conditions, others claimed it was an egg-shaped orb, and many did not get into specifics about what the object was at all, but all the stories told of the same curse. Those who misused this object brought upon themselves an eternal day. They could no longer walk beneath the moonlight not because it would harm them, but because their bodies would not allow them to physically move. They endured a paralysis, a forced sleep. In addition, they would be unable to rest during the day. They would be drawn into the sunlight and washed free in its warmth of any midnight spells that might linger on them. The curse separated them from every aspect of the night, which meant in my long hours of theorizing and resolve if the worst should happen, that I could be freed from my vampirism. If not, I would die a flaming death in the sunlight, but either way my condition would come to an end if I could find this item. I left home alone in case the worst should happen. My parents were old and I did not need them to see me meet a horrific end. I killed on my journey. Food was hard to come by outside of Dartabawa and fewer people were willing to accept that I was in complete control of my condition. That is to say that none of them were. If they didn't immediately try to kill me, they ran for their lives in fear that I would kill them. It was an extremely isolating and eye-opening journey. After a year of countless days spent grumbling in shadows while the sun took its time to set, stormy days sometimes letting me travel faster, I finally made it to Rosewood. Just beyond the sweet little city stood the Maya Woods waiting for me to risk its shifting landscape and thick green trails for my desires. In the first days it took me to purchase tools for surviving the swampy forest ahead, I came upon a terrible piece plastered to a city notice board. There was no picture nor physical description as most bounties will give, only a few key points that no one but I could tell identified me alone. It read, Vampire travels west, violent, merciless, alone will spare no one. Flee upon first sight of anything suspiciously matching such a description. Male, generous reward, dead or alive, paid by North Pass, named Adrian Fish. I was not offended to be called violent or merciless. To hear the thriving city of North Pass had put a bounty on my head was interesting and I wondered if the bodies I'd drained when passing through had belonged to families of some importance. But to see my name standard, the name Volish, 
given to me by my loving parents, deformed into something like fish. I was enraged. Rosewood saw an unnecessary amount of bloodshed across its orchards that night. Into the swamp, bloodied by others and strong on a full stomach, I wandered until the rains washed me clean and I found the hovel of Bog Swallow. I had not expected to find a settlement of any kind where I was going and was thankful for what seemed temporarily like luck. Only two days were spent travelling to and from the ramshackle town and swamp before I found the half-sunken temple entrance that was meant to lead me to my freeing curse. But the forsaken place was heavily scented with decay. My undead nature did not make me immune to the walking corpses and their bile. I had a means of entry, knew which halls to take, and several ideas of what I was looking for but no way to get to it. It was too dangerous. Then another stroke of luck seemed to find me when three adventurers meandered into Bog Swallow. Lost, in need of work while they regained their bearings, and just foolish enough to accept a quest from a stranger who never specified payment or dangers of the task ahead, I sent them into the swampy temple to clear it out for me. That was where my delusions of luck dried up. The three adventurers returned with a heavy book of a language I could not read and an egg the size of a human head. My request had simply been for them to clear the temple of undead. I had no right to take the items they'd scavenged along the way and had not anticipated they would find and take the exact items I was after. Killing them was the only option. But... They bested me, even with the grotesque swamp rats doing my bidding and the clouds swirling into a rage of lightning, the three adventurers nearly decapitated me. My condition allowed me to transform into the mists of which was copious around Bog Swallow and escape with my cursed life, but not before I could hear their mutterings. Was that the vampire Adrian Fish, the male elf inquired? What a stupid name, Adrian Fish, the female elf laughed. I don't think we got him. We should hunt him down, the human man proposed. That is a pretty silly name, though. These foul adventurers have crossed my path several times since. They nearly staked my heart in the city of Spruce Thorn. Then they tracked me south to Hillspire. I could not even shake them in the clay wastes where the waters flow red and my feeding went otherwise unnoticed until they showed up. I put out bounties on their heads but never heard back from those I hired. And all the while I was forced to see repeated bounty posters for Adrian Fish cropping up wherever I went. So I write these pages for those three adventurers and any other pest that wishes to pursue me further. I am going home. You will not find me in the sprawling dark of Databawa no matter how you try. And you'll not hear of slaughters underground in the Sunlands because that is not necessary there. Leave me alone. I will live out my cursed life until I find another means of ending it myself. And for the sake of all that is undead or unholy, my name is not Adrian Fish. It is Adrian Volish. Now I can really only imagine the endless frustrations this Adrian Volish must have endured if any of this is true. To have a regal name like Volish mispronounced and misspelled as Fish, and suddenly an entire nation calling you by the wrong name, that would, that would be embarrassing and I would dwell on it to no end if it were me. However, I think the idea of vampires living in a desert, even underground in one, it seems highly unlikely. So hopefully this Adrian Volish is just a character and this isn't actually a short memoir of someone who has 
suffered more than their fair share of miscommunication. With all of that said, I am out of things to read for this evening and I don't wish to prattle on about nothing when I could be spending my time more productively by getting work done. I might even read through Deceiving Night Terrors a bit to see if there's another story I might share tomorrow after light set. As a final notice, I want to wish good luck to our volunteers wandering Mandrift this evening and remind those of you still trying to fall asleep that you should not be gawking out your windows at them and the Queen's Guard are set to immediately apprehend you if you are seen trying to communicate with anyone and interrupt the test. Have a wonderful evening, Mandrift. We will now stop the recording and replay it.